Greetings and welcome. Thank you to each and every listener for joining me today for my podcast on What Brings You In. My name is Bradley Wink, and I am an aspiring mental health counselor here to promote mental health awareness, discuss mental health topics, and spread some positive energy. If this is your first time joining us, thank you so much for being here today. I hope there is something in this podcast for you to take away and graciously impact your day to day. If you are a returning listener, it's a pleasure having you here with us. As we get started today, I want to ask you all a couple of questions. Do you ever catch yourself checking out your social media frequently throughout the day? Have you ever compared yourself to someone on social media and instantly feel a sense of uneasiness about yourself? Is it difficult to post a photo without using a filter? It is so easy to fall victim to the implications of our social media, but what does this mean for our mental health? How is this impacting youth? And what can we do to keep our mental health in check while living in a digitalized world? With the explosive increase in mobile device use and access to the internet, individuals are spending more time on electronic devices than ever before. Concurrently, the prevalence of mental health problems in adolescents is increasing. Consequently, researchers are investigating the effects of elevated electronic device use on various negative health outcomes in adolescents such as sleep problems, anxiety, lower self-esteem, and psychological distress. The use of social networking services such as Snapchat, Instagram, and Facebook is especially prevalent. These services are used both as a communication tool for ordinary daily matters or chats and as space where one can express or listen to feelings, their own stressors, or depressive symptoms. I am joined today by Laura Pasker, LMHC, and CCTP, who is the owner and operator of her own mental health practice, Clarity Counseling Solutions, located in Palm Harbor, Florida. Laura, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Bradley. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. As always, I am recording at the CoLab Studios in Clearwater, Florida, and I want to give a big shout out to the wonderful staff who makes this podcast possible. This episode is titled, Looking Beyond the Filter, The Effects of Social Media and Mental Health. As always, before we get started, the views, information, or opinions expressed in this podcast are solely the views of those individuals involved and by no means represent absolute facts. Opinions expressed by the host and guest can change at any time. At time, this podcast may cover sensitive topics and we ask you refrain from listening if you are likely to be offended or adversely impacted by any of these topics. Neither the company, the producer, the host, nor the guest shall at any time be liable for the content covered causing offense, distress, or any other reaction. I am not a licensed mental health counselor, and this podcast should not be used to substitute for actual mental health support. So Laura, you have quite a bit of experience working in the mental health field. And just so we are all on the same page, I want to let the listeners know, Laura has over 18 years of experience working as a behavioral health professional, providing both therapeutic services as well as development and operations of programs within the public and private sector of behavioral health care and substance abuse. She has been in leadership roles within systems of care, working with justice-involved individuals, the unhoused and food insecure, those involved with the child and family welfare and advocacy system, crisis intervention and critical care services, inpatient, outpatient, and community-based services, as well as in private practice spaces, inclusive of most recently building her own private practice. Laura is a graduate of Damon University in New York, and she received her master's from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. Laura is a licensed therapist in both Florida and Illinois, and she specialized training in addiction, mindfulness, DBT, motivational interviewing, emotional coaching, grief and trauma-based approaches such as EMDR. So, Laura, I am beyond thrilled to have you here so we can talk about this very important topic. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah. So, I always tell my listeners as we go into these interviews, we try to not have them as scripted. So, we're just going to go and make this the best that we can. And I think in general, people have an idea that mental health and social media are going to go hand in hand. But before we really get into that, I just wanted to get a brief kind of outline of what got you into the counseling profession to begin with? I think that's a great question because we all have life experiences that guide us and lead us on our journey called life. So uh, I would say as even a young age, I was always somebody who was helping others and really empathic in many ways. So um, 
getting into the psychology field just felt kind of natural, even though I started out as a physician's assistant major. Oh, yeah. But it was fun. I took my first intro to psychology class and just sort of fell in love with the idea and concepts and sort of the ability it gave me to do many different things. So having worked with uh, justice-involved individuals, um, my master's is in forensic psychology, so I really felt drawn to understanding the, the legal side of things as well, so anywhere where the law and psychology meets. And that sort of led me into working with domestic violence families and victims and working with families in the community within shelters and then also people who were maybe coming out of incarceration, whether they were juveniles or adults. So um, it really kind of just naturally unfolded. And then working in addiction, that was one space I never really thought I would end up working in. And it's been one of those areas that I've really enjoyed and feel really passionate about. I've heard that that happens with a lot of our majors. They go out there and they think they're going to go one way and then something they completely did not even think was going to happen for them does. So yeah. that's pretty cool. What made you go into private counseling? Having worked in both uh, for-profit and non-profit spaces for years, um, just really wanting to create that space of my own and having that autonomy, um, really enjoying being able to create, have that creative process. And um, with all the experience I have had, I kind of felt like in some ways there were some niches missing and mm. maybe that was something I could do to, yeah. to provide for the community in which I awesome. live. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and get into the social media factor because that is what we're here to talk about. And just so that we are all aware, when we talk about social media, we're also kind of talking about phone usage. We're talking about how that impacts our youth, as is something that we brought up in the intro. But then also, you know, it is important, too, because it is impacting adults as well. It's not just the youth centered that's happening. I think now we are faced with a time where youth are exposed to social media. They're exposed to technology at a very young age. But I still think that there's a lot to focus on with the adult aspect, too. So what do you think? I, let's start it with a, like a general question. You know, what would so what do you think social media is doing to self-image, um, both for adolescents and for adults? When you think about it, we're exposed to so many different, you know, facets of technology now that even as a child, I wasn't. So, you know, whether it's being on something at school and being in front of a screen or phones, I mean, When's the last time you saw a payphone? <laughs> yeah, right. Know if there yeah. are any anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, um, kids at a very young age have a, a phone in hand, whereas, you know, 35, 40, 50 year olds, we didn't have those things. So, um, television in your room, you know, right. I didn't grow up with a television in my room. Now right. we have them in every room of our house. So, things right. have changed. So, exposure has definitely increased for all of us, even if we grew up with it or not, and um, more people to compare ourselves to mm -hmm. or to question sort of, am I where I am supposed to be in life? Should I be somewhere else? So I think it kind of leads into some of those questions, that internal monologue that we all have, am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I where, I, where I'm meant to be? And what's that next step? And mm -hmm. Is it fear-based? Is it, right. you know, supporting and, myself? Like, what is it? Right. And that's something, if you had a client, that's something you would dive into with them, I would assume, with time. But how often do you think people actually compare themselves to other people via social media outlets? Honestly, I would think we do it daily. Daily. You know? And I yeah. think all of us are included in that, whether it's a product Mm -hmm. That there's an algorithm that's now selling me, <laughs> right? You know, this new shampoo because I looked at this and, well, could my hair be like that? You know, could my smile look like this if I use this teeth whitener because I Googled right. toothpaste? Right. <laughs> you know, right. so right. Um, I think we compare even at an unconscious level that we're not even aware of. But when we're struggling more with maybe some anxiety or self image issues, that becomes that sort of daily theme internally, which then can trigger some stress and anxiety. And I think that's important, though. I think sometimes we don't think that other people are also doing what we're doing hmm. because we all sit here and we all I mean, it's very easy. I know the double edged sword that comes with um, social media, because for me, I remember when Facebook came out. Um, I know it was at first kind of more for like a college aspect of things where mm -hmm. you make that online profile. But by the time, you know, it kind of went mainstream, now you kind of see this shift in the dynamic where there are people that genuinely, in a positive note, I get to see 
more frequently, like maybe what is going on in their lives or who their kids are. Things that, especially in my case, I moved away after high school, you know, I probably wouldn't keep in contact with many of these people. And now you still get to see them. That's kind of a positive that can come from it. But the, the negative is you're kind of keeping in kind of like that chronological order of, okay, well, maybe now I should be where they are because they've had two kids and they just bought a house and I'm still, you know, living in an apartment or whatever is going through your head, or maybe they got a job promotion. Do you think people only post the good things on social media or do you think that maybe it is an honest platform? I think that probably depends upon the person and sort of the place they're at within their life at that time. Um, I think we want to show our best self like it's a very public way. You know, it's kind of like when you would get ready for school each morning and your parents made sure you brushed your teeth and, <laughs> right. you know, you combed your hair and you were ready for school. You had on clean clothes. Um, you want to present your best self if others are going to be able to see that. So if there is somebody struggling, I think they also can show that negative side as well. But I think also for people who maybe are in a space of not feeling heard, mm. that kind of becomes a platform to be heard and mm -hmm. seen in so many ways. You know, looking for that like, looking for somebody to respond, even if it's a negative post, we're still going to empathize with that person. And somebody may reach out, you know, so sorry for your loss or... The first year is hard, but they're getting it. It's that way to have that connection and interaction. So I think we tend to probably show more of the positive and the good things happening. But I think it serves serves both and sort of depends where we are. In our own yeah, journey, our, journey. our own growth. Yep, yep. Right. So what has been – have you had any experiences in your profession that you can talk about where – this has been an issue that's centered around maybe the underlying issue of why somebody's seeking counseling or something that maybe is more prevalent than another issue? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Bradley, um, especially with a lot of kids, like a lot of the teens too. Um, social media is their way to connect. And without their phone, I mean, that's worse than saying you're grounded <laughs> right. for a month and can't see a right. friend if you don't have your phone. It is the end of the world. And you know, from things to posting something, a video on Snapchat that maybe somebody didn't want to be shared or mm -hmm. sharing something personal that maybe a young kid disclosed to somebody else that as an adult, we wouldn't necessarily be embarrassed by it. But when you're a teen and you're trying to make friends, sometimes you right. are. So, um, you know, I've definitely seen that happen, too, especially with like body image mm -hmm. issues as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, not just with teens, even even adults as well, like you were mentioning comparing to people from the past or am, am I at the right place in my life? Well, Tim over here is married and has five kids. Mm -hmm. Where am I at? You know, I'm right. just starting school. Right. What am I doing wrong instead of looking at it from the place of what am I doing right? It's my own path. It's my own journey. So, you know, I think they're similar mm -hmm. based on age, but different in, right. in many experiences. Right. So a lot of times it's even helping adolescents sort of understand what healthy boundaries are and, you know, what's something you do share and maybe you don't share. How do you how do you learn how to trust somebody? What are those components of trust? Like, how do I know this person is safe to maybe share something that's pretty personal and I know they're not going to share it with somebody else? So exactly. I think sometimes that's led to maybe even, you know, some suicidal thoughts and things where... Mm -hmm. There has right. to be some safety planning or hospitalization. So Right. And I think with the imaging, too, that is a big part of it, obviously. But I think I can't remember the specific study that I saw, but there was something in my undergraduate work where there was a study that younger, younger children, um, and I say children, adolescents, you know, kind of in there, they don't know the standard of beauty beyond a filter. It was they're comparing themselves to Snapchat filters, that's kind of this new standard of what it means to be beautiful. And I I just remember being kind of baffled by that. I was like, what do you mean? Like, I mean, and how do you, you know, if you were to say, let's say that there is maybe a listener who has a child who maybe they don't know how to kind of relate to them because they can't relate to what this means anyway. I mean, do you have any suggestions or like ways that maybe you could approach that situation? I think it's just trying to have an open dialogue and, you know, kids are the best educators in many ways. You know, um, when I'm sitting with an adult or a teen, it doesn't matter their age. I'm still learning and taking something from them. So 
I always want, especially kids, to help educate me. Well, help me understand why. Why is this connection so important? Or why is it you feel you need to look differently? Because it, it's usually a different route to yeah. what's happening. Yeah. You know, there's something else underlying that. You know, you're sort of helping them understand how to peel back those layers of the onion and understand you know, that intention behind that behavior or action or why they don't feel comfortable with who they are. And, you know, then I think that second step, too, is sort of identifying, well, what do you like? Mm -hmm. You know, what would you not right. want to put a filter on? You know, right. what what in this moment do you feel positively beautiful and content about? Like, what's that asset or attribute that you would want to share with the world and mm -hmm. you feel like you're known for? So, um, you know, we tend to gravitate more towards the negative. That's just kind of how our minds work. So mm -hmm. it takes a bit more effort to focus on that positivity or something you're grateful for. So I think that's so important. Right. That's a great. That's awesome. I mean, that's a great way of explaining it. And I love that because there are, you know, there are so many. And again, we always talk about the subjectivity in, in psychology and counseling, really in anything. But, you know, it, it made me think of um, Pink. She's my favorite artist. And She's at amazing. one point she... Um, <laughs> She had said how her daughter came to her and just said, like, I'm the ugliest child I know. Or somebody had said that to her at school or something with it. And she just kind of broke it down kind of how you did. And she was like, well, you know, what is like, what is this coming from? Like, why, why do you feel like that? And why are you kind of taking their words as something that you believe? And then she turned it into this really, really positive thing. And um, I just think it's really important to, to hear that. But we obviously know for people who might be kind of thinking about how much of an issue this is. I mean, if a child or if anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts and it is kind of based on image issues, you know, obviously that's a time to find services that need to be sought after. But is there, would you say that there would ever be a point maybe where it would be more beneficial for a child to come into counseling if it weren't already to that, that degree? Absolutely. I think if any child or anybody for that matter is having some a, a circumstance or situation impacting not just one, but multiple areas of their life, whether it's, you know, academics or maybe not wanting to get involved in sports or after school activities, you know, there's likely something going on. And, you know, therapy should be a safe space and a healthy space to be able to share your thoughts and feelings, whether they're good or whether they're bad, you know, right. that idea of even maintenance therapy is a great thing mm -hmm. to just to have that time and space to focus on what is going well. So, um, so I think if you even notice some of those small things, you know, how can we normalize to this generation and our kids that it's okay to talk to somebody and, it may not always want to be your parents who you're going to share that with, but maybe there is that neutral person and, and sort of finding what it is your kid's looking for. Like, what's important to you? You know, I go to therapy. It's OK. Would you prefer to talk to somebody younger, somebody mm -hmm. older, male, mm -hmm. female, non-binary, right. like however they right. identify? So right. I think that's so important to sort of check in with right. your kids, too, to know what it is. Yeah. sort of who who they're going to maybe feel the most comfortable with. And that kind of answers the question too, you know, for some people who might be thinking, you know, is there, should I look for something different in a therapist for my child versus what I would look for for myself and a counselor? So I think you kind of hit that. I mean, it's really kind of, well, what are you comfortable with? And that's all that really matters, you know, and finding that. And obviously there are some counselors who are going to be more apt to taking on, maybe they focus specifically on adolescent development or they might focus yep. on child psychology. So you always just look at the research in your area. But I mean, there are resources that are out there. Can you think of anything kind of off the top of your head, like a resource for people if they don't quite know where to go? Yeah. Psychology Today is an amazing resource because, you know, as a clinician, we pay to be on there to mm -hmm. um, list ourselves, mm -hmm. but also they verify your credentials and background. So having worked in treatment for a long time and having folks who were maybe from other states, it was a great resource to be able to have and know that the license was verified. So you can filter through, um, filter in a more positive way, I mm -hmm, guess, mm -hmm. um, through uh, insurance issues, gender um, hours mm -hmm. that they're available as well, or working with teens or mm -hmm. any other specialties. Mm -hmm. So that's a great sort of first stop place, I would say, to, yeah. to search for somebody. Right. And what do you think, um, what are your views on telehealth? Do you do you like telehealth? Do you think it's an effective tool or do you prefer in session? 
I think that's not about me. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Therapy is about yeah. the other person who's sitting on the other side of me. So if that most if the most comfortable space for them is telehealth, I'm there to partner with them on that journey. So um, doing trauma work, I tend to prefer to be in person. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I can do that telehealth as well. So right. um, and sometimes I've worked with folks building up to coming into the office gotcha. as well. So, gotcha. uh, you know, I think it's a hybrid approach and it's really about whatever is most comfortable for the right. person reaching out for right. the support at the time. And I like to ask that with counselors just because it is such a new thing for us. You know, I mm -hmm. think, and especially with COVID, it really kind of jumped uh, jumped the, the, the top of the list with that, if you will, because it was the only option for counseling for many people for a while. And now I think it's interesting to see how it's formatting itself into everyday life. And for people who are doing maintenance counseling or people who are doing whatever their counseling journey is. So I do like to ask that question. I just think it's like a, a, an interesting way of kind of approaching it because it might be easier for your child to, yes. to take it with, it might be more comfortable for them. So, and honestly, I, through COVID, I had a handful, I probably had a larger teen caseload at that point. And I think for that reason, because some of them couldn't be in school, schools were closed, right? but they were more comfortable in their room sitting at their desk where they do school each day and being able to share more of their space and what was happening. So I did mm. find with with some of those individuals that we were able to get through maybe to the root of what was happening a little bit quicker because they were in the comfort of their own space. Right. And that might be a good approach for anyone who is considering to have this conversation with a child. Um, you know, this is something, you know, you don't necessarily have to go into an office to do yeah. this. Like you could be in your room, you know, it's your privacy. I mean, and I think that's a good point is to respect the privacy of it because Absolutely. that is something we run into with, with the uh, telehealth situation. So do you think it would be, or do you think we would say it's mentally kind of unhealthy for us if we can't break ourselves to kind of disconnect from social media? Yeah, I think that's another great question because anything we use outside of ourselves, we can use in an unhealthy or healthy way. So, I mean, that's sort of the premise of addiction in general, right? Right. Things can be a good, healthy coping skill or resource until they're not, until I'm essentially dependent upon it. So um, I think a great example I always try to explain to clients is what's the difference between I'm abusing something and I'm addicted to it. And the answer to that question is the obsession. And if I'm addicted, I have that sort of obsessive thought or I can't live without it in some way. So you can insert whatever that said thing right. is. Yeah. So that could be social media if mm -hmm. I'm if it's impacting my relationships or, you know, my partner keeps saying, hey, can't you get off the phone while we're having dinner or I'm having a conversation? You know, as much as we like to think we're engaged we're not engaged when we're distracted somewhere else. So um, so I think that's always a good indicator. Am I in that sort of constant thinking? And am I moving out of things I once enjoyed? And are other people pointing that out to me? Right. Maybe right. maybe I need a break. Right. And how what what would be some ways that you could take a break from social media? Because in the same sense of what you just, you know, we think and you said with addiction, you could insert whatever you needed to hear. I think it's very difficult for people to think I'm addicted to my social media. So what would be a strategy to disassociate from that? Yeah, I, a couple things that I think are simple. Um, a few years ago, uh, I had a few friends who decided to do like a social media detox and mm -hmm. fast, so to speak. And it was seven days, right? So um, we joined in together and did it. And I had to move all the icons to the last <laughs> page yeah. of my phone because yeah. it was that automatic habit of turning on my phone, swiping up. Yeah. Let me see what's happening. Oh, wait, no, <laughs> I need to move it. So, <laughs> right. um, so I think having some conscious time like that, like maybe if you are finding it um, more intrusive in the sense of compulsive to wanting to go look at it, move it to a different page. So there's a couple other things you're going to see before you get to Facebook, Snapchat or Instagram or um, whatever TikTok, whatever the social right, media right, is. Right, whatever right. your your outlet is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it, partnering with uh, another friend or doing it as a household. You know, if it's mm -hmm. a family, maybe you guys do it together and it's something you do a few days before the holiday so that you're spending that quality time because I think we've all been in that place where 
oh, I'm going to, I have 10 minutes, I'm going to sit down on the couch, I'm going to relax. And then you look up and it's 30 minutes have passed. And <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Well, especially with reels, like the yes. Instagram reels, the TikTok reels or whatever they are. I don't even know. I, I mean, I watch them. I can't even say what platform. I feel like they just show up on my phone sometime. The next thing I know, it's been 45 minutes and I'm like, <laughs> wow, I had 18 <laughs> things to do and I've done none of them. So it's very easy to get swept up in that. And I think there's something too, and I haven't done the research into it, but something about the short clips that just keep us so attentive on what's happening because you can go from one clip to the next and you get a very good outline of information from just that short time. So, I mean, obviously, like for me, I watch a lot of like cake decorating and stuff like that because yeah. I'm really into it. So obviously they're not actually decorating this cake in 10 seconds, but it feels like they are. And I feel satisfied from that. So then I go to the next one and it's it's this like complete, like this completed thing. And it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a, a workout something or if it's a drawing yeah. or painting or people who sing, because it's probably going to be a good thing that's coming from that. Like they're probably very good singers, you know, especially if it shows like a clip from like a American Idol or yeah. or whatever it is. So I think there is something there too, where it's like you just, it's that satisfaction of continuing to scroll. Yeah. You can fit more within a shorter amount of time, but yet you end up spending more time. So yeah. Being kind of out of it. So yeah, there's some good uh, research I'm sure to be yeah, said in good there. Study. So, <laughs> but, um, you know, you did bring in a really good topic too. And it was talking about looking at social media at nighttime. So what are your kind of thoughts or what are some things that you've been able to find with that? Yeah, you know, I think even for myself, for myself or speaking for, you know, working with teens and stuff and even adult patients who may have come in for depression or anxiety, you know, we're always talking about what's the routine, what's the habit, what's the structure that's going to help support whatever your end goal is. So um we look at sleep and what those habits are and healthy sleep hygiene really makes a difference. So um, when you had brought this idea and topic to me, that's one thing that kind of kept coming up was it wasn't necessarily in all the research I looked at about the length of time. And, and this was based on, you know, medical students in India, um, University of Arizona had done some work and mm -hmm. a couple other places in Toronto. It was about the time in which they were actually engaged in it. So, um, and some of them went in further to talk about blue light and how that impacts us. So um, even looking at exposing people to either blue light or green light, right. <laughs> and it, was there a difference? And it, it impacts our melatonin production. And we need melatonin. Like as the sun goes down, our mm -hmm. body starts to produce it and we start to get into that relaxing state so that our body can repair itself and process the day. Right. But if we're then in front of a screen and we're being exposed to more of that blue light, especially right as we go to sleep, we're not gonna get that deep sleep. We're not gonna get that restful repair, repairing sleep that we really do need. And you know, there was a great analogy I'd read that um, sleep is like gas for our car. Oh, okay. And that's so true, right? Because if I don't go put gas in my car later today, right. it's not gonna run. <laughs> I'm gonna be stuck on the highway and I'm gonna have to call AAA. So if I don't get enough sleep or the right type of gas that right. my car takes, right. it's gonna have damage. So um, I think that's a great analogy to kind of remember that we need sleep to process our day, to store those memories so that we can recall them, so that we're not stressed and we're not meant to be in that Fight or flight fight nervous or flight. system, yes. right? Yeah. So right. when I don't get enough sleep, that impacts my ability to empathize with others. I'm more irritable, you know? Right. How many times have we all probably woken up late at times and you hit every light and you're frustrated? Yes. And there's yeah. higher incidence of road rage right. when we're not getting enough sleep. So right. it can impact that immediate day, but long term, the ripple effect. Of that, yeah. 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 So, um, and on average, I, I believe it was saying, at least one to two hours before bed to we shouldn't be disconnect in front of the from it. Yeah. 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 I know. We're all guilty of it. I right. Mean. Right. It's funny. I am. Um, and that's even kind of what you were talking about too, with like, we pretty much all have televisions in our rooms and I, some people do, I think they get into a habit of kind of needing the sound maybe, or yeah. it's just having something there, maybe background noise, whatever it is. And it can be a relaxing thing, I guess, you know, you don't want the couch, you want your bed, but I, I have read multiple studies that say, 
how it really is better for you to just kind of take the TV out of the bedroom. And I did actually, I had the opportunity to do that and I do not miss having my TV in my bedroom anymore. And it kind of separates you too. It's like, all right, this is my time on the couch to watch TV yeah. at the end of the day. Well, now that I'm getting up and I'm getting ready for bed, that means, you know, no more. And I'm still bad about the screen time because it, you even, you know, I am setting my alarm clock on my phone. So I'm yeah. kind of, you know, I'm definitely looking, but if I'm going to look at my alarm clock, I might as well look at whatever else is kind of tempting and that's there. So I think this is a really good point to bring up. Yeah. And what's your intention? Like you're making intentional steps to try to make that space just for restful sleep, right? right? right. So as long as we make these small steps, it leads to very large changes in our life without us even realizing that. So even in this small time, you may have even noticed a big mm -hmm. difference in how more restful you're feeling yeah. in the morning when you wake up. Yeah, absolutely. It was funny because I even I always keep an old school alarm clock around just mm -hmm. because you never know when your phone's going to crash. That's true. And then you don't have an alarm <laughs> clock. And I was even like thinking because I, I really did want to commit to that where because I will get caught up into it. And it's like, man, maybe I should just like go old school, put that alarm clock out there and like just go yep. full, like, you know, full out of the the screen space. But I mean, it's it's a great point to make to listeners that if you want to see a difference, maybe this is a great spot, a great spot to to start that. Yeah. So. We're not gonna change access and exposure exposure to technology. Like it's here, it's here to stay, it's helpful, it's supportive in many ways. Like I wouldn't say we would need to get rid of it. I just think we have to be aware of what we're using and how we're using it and what's our intention. So, you know, even something great I'll suggest to people is Insight Timer is an amazing app. It's free. It has mm -hmm. meditation. Um, everybody can upload like their own meditations. You can follow people. You can just listen to music and play mm -hmm. it for a certain period of time. But you can create these communities on it um, and you can search by topic. So if I'm oh, struggling right. with anxiety tonight... I can search for an anxiety and sleep meditation. I can look gotcha. for a one that's step related, but you know, mm -hmm. maybe it's somebody in recovery and they're working on step three and it's focused on that. So it's guided or not wow. guided, yeah. but it's based on topic. And when you log on to it, the front page has a world map and it has mm. little pings of everybody oh, wow. around the world who's meditating. And oh, wow. I love it because it's sort of this feeling of I'm not alone. Like right. somebody else it reminds in you that Australia right now is meditating <laughs> when I right. am. Like, I wonder what's going on there. So right. I feel right. like it brings that human yeah. component to it that yeah, I'm absolutely. not the only one yeah. maybe what struggling was, right now. What was it called? Insight Timer. Insight. Okay. And we are not getting paid for that, by the way. It's just a really good app that yes. we want to suggest. Yeah. <laughs> and it's free. And it's free. Exactly. Yes. That's perfect. So another thing I want us to kind of talk about, do you think that people, let's talk about, I mean, we know what interest, like introspect is, like interception in psychology. Can you kind of briefly explain what that would mean and how it correlates to what we're talking about? Yeah. So interception is the kind of like, they'll describe it as like our sixth sense. It's the awareness of what my body feels at any given moment. So a lot of times when we've maybe had anxiety or stress for a period of time or have had trauma, and trauma is a spectrum, right? Right. It, it may be a loss of a loved one. It may be a loss of a job. It could be, you know, sexual abuse. It, yeah. There's an array there. So um, what happens is we tend to not connect with our bodies as the way to protect ourselves. So when you think of fight, flight, freeze, that's our brain's way and our nervous system's way of protecting itself so we don't continue to be traumatized in that moment. So sometimes when we've experienced events or chronic stress, we live in that lower level sympathetic nervous system and our body is tense and we're not even aware. So, you know, I'll always ask folks too, about, you know, how they're feeling and what their body feels like. And nine times out of 10, nobody can really connect with it. Oh, yeah, I feel fine. I'm not in my sympathetic nervous system. But then when we take a look at it and I ask some further questions, it's, okay, well, do you feel any tightness or tension in your body? And, well, yeah, my shoulder and mm -hmm. my jaw. And, mm -hmm. okay, well, is this a life or death moment? Is this a fight right. or flight moment? Well, no, I'm in your office. I feel safe. I know mm -hmm. you. We're talking about this. Okay, then I need to release that tension and stress because I'm sending a message to my body is sending a message essentially to my brain to say, this is similar to something that happened over here. So I need to protect myself. Right. We're not calm. We're not in that right. ventral vagal state, which is where we really want to be. Right. Um, so our body's functioning optimally and, and we're connecting. So that idea of interception really starts with 
what is my body feeling at any given moment? And if I have stress or tension, is it warranted right now or is it not? And if it's right. not, I can release it. So we're essentially rewiring that neural pathway to realize that, okay, not everything is a fight or flight moment. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like that idea behind um, a lot of the trauma trauma work that Bessel does and mm -hmm. your body keeps score. Our body's the gatekeeper. So right. I had read an interesting fact recently that 80% of our 80% of the neural fibers in our vagus nerve communicate what our body feels to our brain. Right. So think about that. Right. My body is right. telling my brain what to think and what to connect it to. So it's so important. And then if we circle back to the concept of sleep, mm -hmm. I'm not getting enough sleep. I'm probably still in that sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. And that message may be off because there's still stress and tension in my body. So you know, that whole idea of connecting back with what it is my body feels, I think, is so important. Mm -hmm. And being able to kind of connect to that awareness, to connect to the awareness of that is the first step in kind of identifying it. Because knowing that and kind of with what we're saying with the social media aspect of things, it creating that sort of safe space for you to kind of disconnect and then be in your in your body. I mean, to be in your thought process, listening to what's happening to yourself and then. Yep going forward with it. So and think about sleep. You know, that's our time where there's not cars driving next to you. The radio's not on. Your phone's not ringing. You know, somebody's not at the door. We have so much external stimuli that we're used to that our body needs that quiet, restful repair time. So if we're not getting that and there is that constant noise, even if you think of it from that perspective, Maybe the TV isn't the greatest thing to be listening to and, mm -hmm. and, and what the content is. I mean, I think for some people, sometimes the content matters, mm -hmm. but not for everybody. Like the research really doesn't show that want, watching one thing right before bed or the other, I think right. it's based on person and sort of their own experiences. But yeah, we need to have that mm -hmm. time to shut down, allow mm -hmm. that melatonin to work naturally right, yeah, so that right, we can Right, without having get... to like take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> like, exactly. That's kind of the the point with that one. So another concept to consider as we kind of round out these discussions in psychology is the emotional contagion theory, which states that whatever emotion is expressed by someone, such emotions tend to be transferred very much like the exact same emotion they were feeling. So basically, social media can play into this because it stimulates this, the emotions that you're seeing is probably the best way to say it. So if you see something that is sad or depressed or depressing, I should say, it's going to stimulate a very similar negative emotion to those who read the posts. So likewise, happy and cheerful posts are supposed to stimulate happy feelings to those who are exposed to the same post. But we have to keep these kind of in mind of how these do hit our own emotions. So Really what this is coming down to are our mirror neurons. And I know, Laura, you kind of have some thought on that. Yeah. When you had brought up the emotional contagion theory, that's the first thing I thought of. Like this is that's actually what validates why that happens. So um, the idea behind mirror neurons is it's a type of sensory motor cell that's located in our brain that's activated when an individual performs an action or observes another performing the same action. So those neurons essentially mirror, mirror each other's um, right. actions. Um, so when you look at, you know, certain behavior and you're sensing that empathy, you're going to mirror that vice versa. Or if somebody is stressed, if you're calm, then their nervous system may mirror that. So like, I'll always give folks the example, um, you know, I have a ton of pillows on my couch in my office. <laughs> right, so, right. Um, you know, I'll I'll reference this pillow here, and yeah, you know, I'll, I'll let the client know, and you know, you can even do it right now. So right. this tissue box right here okay. is a baby. Okay. Yes. And this baby, we fed him, we right. changed his diaper. He is still crying. We don't know what's wrong. Right. So we have to pick up this baby and try to console him and see what's wrong. So. Thinking about this crying baby and we don't know what's wrong and we've tried everything we could, where do you feel that stress or tension in your body? You're about to pick up this baby who's screaming right now. Where do you physically feel it? I mean, I feel it in my head. I'm thinking okay. of what's making this baby cry. Okay. Yeah, okay. Like, exactly. Right. What 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 is going on in this baby's mind that can be consoled? Exactly. So for me, when I think about picking up this tissue box that's the baby crying, I feel it in my chest and right. I feel it a bit in my jaw. Like, 
okay, I'm, and, I'm t- and I take a breath every time I do this example. <laughs> like I take a breath as I pick up the baby and I'm patting him on the back and I'm not sure what's wrong, buddy, but we're going to figure it out. I'm mm-hmm. here. You're not. We're going to get through right, this together, yeah, right? Right, right, right. And all of a sudden that baby starts to calm down. Maybe that crying's not as significant. So we mirror each other's behaviors. We mirror each other's nervous system. So right. if I'm heightened, somebody else is going to be heightened. If I can try to lower my stress level and calm down, get out of that sympathetic nervous system as much as I can, the other person's going to follow suit as well, too. So right. it's it, it's even the idea of like tone of voice and volume. If right. you tend to lower your voice, somebody else <laughs> lowers their voice, too. So right. these are things that happen that we don't even realize happen. So I think it's important to kind of like just note some of maybe what happens on social media, too, with seeing some of these posts, because there's been times where maybe you have to snooze somebody for right. <laughs> 30 days, yes. right? I would because say especially around election time. That's <laughs> probably <laughs> it's yes. a good time to... <laughs> And maybe not check your mail. Yeah, you exactly. Have, you know, right. In the mail. Right. But when you're recognizing how you're feeling going on there, like, again, what's your intent behind going on and scrolling today? Is it five minutes to relax? Is it to see what your cousin's doing in Alaska because you haven't seen him in a couple of years? Right. Um, right. So it's really sort of recognizing who it is you are interacting with and how is it making you feel? Because right. even though it's through technology, we may still be mirroring some of that Mm -hmm. based on what that theory says and just mirror neurons. And Exactly. And it's funny when you were saying that I kind of correlated with that as I'm like, what? sometimes I just get on mindlessly. Mm -hmm. And so I do just scroll through and I don't really have an intention. I'm just kind of on there because I'm on there. So I think that also could be relatable to an extent because I'm sure, I mean, it's just like, oh, I'm trying to relax and you know really am I relaxing probably not so much because there's almost always something that pops up and I get the good and the bad of it personally like I mean I do see like I love seeing people's kids you know I always think that's like a fun thing I have friends who have children that I have not ever met just because I live you know in different states and so that's always a good thing Um, but then there are times where I'll see I don't know like somebody that kind of maybe says something or maybe it's a little I don't know, I say ignorant or just something that I'm like, oh, just Doesn't like irks well. me. Yeah. And then yeah. I'm sitting there and I'm like, OK, now I'm kind of annoyed. Like I should have probably never logged on to begin with. But yeah. 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 So I think with anything we do, it's trying to be mindful. Right. Um, there's one definition of mindfulness I always love. And definition of mindfulness in this one article says that it's to be in the present moment without judgment. That is so hard to do. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. It, it, it's very difficult. Even in meditation, you yeah. start worrying about a wandering thought. And it's like, if, if if I'm meditating right now and I'm listening to the music, but I start thinking about my grocery list, it's not beating myself up for having that thought. It's recognizing that I'm having the thought, putting it on the cloud and letting the cloud float by. I'm not judging it. So it's not judging if your intention, if you don't know your intention, but it's recognizing what you feel in that moment that yeah, maybe this isn't really what my body needs right now or my brain. Right. Here's what I'm going to do to take care of myself. So I think if we if we look at what our intention is behind the things we do, we naturally become more mindful. And being in the present moment is being in this room right now with my feet grounded and on the floor, not in the parking lot, not at the grocery store, not with my partner here in this present moment. So um, so I think it's important to to remember that as well and trying to create some healthy habits behind how we decompress in the night. So it doesn't really matter what, how much we're using it because, and actually that's another great um, resource to use is our phones will track what our digital use was, right? Yes. Um, I know Android just did an update now, so it actually has it on Android phones as well. And, you know, challenge yourself. Hey, I was six hours on this and eight hours on this this week. I'm going to try to reduce it by an hour each. Right. And have somebody be accountable with you for yeah. that. So um, I'll often keep a folder, too, on my phone of, like, sites of things I want to read or look at mm, that mm-hmm. are positive that I always think I'm going to get to and I usually don't. And typically when I get to them is when I'm avoiding social media for a bit and I'm making that intentional time. It's something that's going to feed my soul, not maybe stress my soul. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It reminds me of, like, closing out your ring on your on your I watch like your exercise yep. rings and stuff. People love doing that. So it's yep. kind of that same concept of challenging yourself maybe to not get on there so often exactly. and just see how you feel after that. Because 
you mentioned that social media detox. I'm sure at some point, whoever did that, and you said you did that yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, did you feel better after you kind of disconnected a little bit? Oh my gosh, within a day and a half, I got through that whole folder of all those articles mm -hmm. I wanted to read. Like, mm -hmm. I ended up cleaning out a <laughs> closet yeah. or something. It was all these other intentional things. I right. it really had every, I was going to do it, but something always yeah. came up. So, um, you know, it's definitely allowed me to be more aware because I wouldn't have thought I, I was doing it to help others. I mm -hmm. didn't really realize how much I would benefit from it. So right. I do every so often try to be mindful, yeah. you know, right. maybe exactly. a couple times a year, probably should do it once a quarter or something, right. but yeah, um, I get it. it's just finding the balance. And I've really set in stone, not going on it after certain times. That's um, yeah, that's great. Even turning on the sleep. Oh, like the focus thing Is that, that what it it's does. Called? I think, yeah, yeah. I can't think of what it's called, yeah. but, um, from 10 to seven, all of mine go black and white. Yeah, that's smart. So you're not getting the blue light. It's less stimulating. If you're right. looking at a recipe, it's mm -hmm. not looking as appetizing because right. it's black and white. <laughs> right, so yeah. I'm not going to scroll as long. I right. put it down and then I end up going doing to do something more intentional. So I think technology can also help us mm -hmm. sort of set these guidelines and parameters for very ourselves true. as well. Very, very true. All right. Well, Laura, I've had a lot of really fun here. I mean, I know we're talking about really kind of intriguing concepts, but I mean, we really have, I think we've had a really good amount of information here, but I want to give you a second. Do you have anything that you want to say to any listeners or any kind of closing thoughts? Yeah, I think this was a great topic. And I think it's important that we do discuss it. And again, be aware, not only for ourselves, but for this generation, kids, family members to just be aware of, you know, what we are consuming, you know, technology wise each day. Bradley, it's with anything. Like as long as we bring something to our awareness and we know that it's happening, we can take action and exactly. accountability for it. So I think that's really what your topic today has brought up, like giving all the listeners just the opportunity to sort of have that moment of, you know, thought, how am I using social media? Am I using it in a healthy way or an unhealthy way? Is somebody else around me using it in an unhealthy way? And is there a way I can support them? And maybe if they are having some challenging challenges, disconnecting from it. So um, so awareness is key. So as long as I have that awareness, I can take some action behind it. And, you know, I hope that people will challenge themselves, even if it's for a couple hours or a yeah. day or even more importantly, turn it off at least an hour before bed. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Do something else. It's a else. good starting point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because sleep really is one of the most important things. And if we don't get that, that impacts our mental health in so many ways. So, and that's going to impact what we see on social media and how we interact with it. If we say something or don't say something. So, you know, our fuse can get shorter when we're not getting enough rest. So um, I think it's really important to a really important topic. So mm -hmm. I hope there's, I hope somebody challenges themselves yeah. to at least maybe break away for an hour. Oh, I'm sure there is. We've, we've hit somebody with this. So I think it's something we can all relate to. It's a very big topic and we're all surrounded by it constantly. So um, I do want to give another big thank you to you, Laura, for not only today, but everything that you do, the work that you do in the field and for constantly being a guiding light for those who need it. We, um, Really hope that, like we said, we were able to touch somebody. Again, Laura, you're at Clarity Counseling Solutions yes. in Palm Harbor. Yes, and um, I'm not currently accepting new clients right now, but I do have a wait list, so I'll okay. be accepting new patients in January and February. And I'm also of the belief system, too, that I may not be the right fit for everybody, but if somebody reaches out, um, I've been in the field for a long time, and mm -hmm. I'm more than happy to help them make those connections. So if they reach out, it may take a little bit to get back, but... You know, right. send an email. You can message me on my website, ClarityCounselingSolutionsLLC.com, and I'm happy to steer them in the right direction because I think the hardest part is reaching out. And it when is. Somebody making that. Takes that opportunity yeah. to reach out. Exactly. It, it's exactly. important to acknowledge it. So. Well, if you have enjoyed what you've heard here today, please give my website a visit as well, www on what brings you in episodes.com, or you can like and subscribe to the Colab Studios for updates in future episodes. As always, I want to thank each and every listener for tuning in today. My name is Bradley Wink, and this has been an episode of On What Brings You In. If you or anyone you know is experiencing a mental health crisis, you can call or text 988 or go to 988lifeline.org. Someone will be there to help you. Thank you again, and have a wonderful rest of your day.